Hello there, my name is Tiffany Orbian. I'm from the Archbishop's Office for Evangelization. I'm here, this, I'm here today with Monsignor Thomas Halik from the Czech Republic. It's a pleasure to be here with you, Monsignor. Monsignor Halik is one of the leading uh, European theologians and intellectuals in our church today. He's an award-winning author, having won the 2010 Best Theological Book in Europe for his work Patience with God, and the recipient of the prestigious Templeton Prize in 2014. This prize recognizes people who have made significant contributions to affirming life's spiritual dimensions, whether it's through their work or through their practical uh, insights. Monsignor Halleck is currently in Australia as a guest of the Archdiocese to talk on mercy and truth and healing alienation in our world today. Monsignor, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for inviting me, Tiffany. Uh, perhaps if we start with um, going back a few years, now before the fall of communism in Eastern Europe, uh, back in 1989, you worked in the underground church in uh, what was then Czechoslovakia. Yes. Um, tell us about how, what was that like for you as a young priest? How did that influence your faith um, under the communist regime? Uh, so I'm very thankful to God for this hard time. I think a little persecution is always healthy for the church, to prevent the church to be fat and lazy and proud. And But it was a little bit too long and too much. But I'm thankful for this experience. I grew up among uh, atheists, among seekers, among agnostics, so I uh, I know their questions, their problems, their language, and it was a very good gift for my future work in the church. Uh, I was uh, uh, ordained uh, secretly. Even my mother didn't know I was a uh, priest for uh, eleven years. I work in the underground church. It was risky. Uh, once my friend asked me when he received the news and one of these underground priests was found murdered by the secret police perhaps, uh, he asked me, uh, do you feel uh, fear? Uh, are you anxious? And uh, I said, of course, uh, I feel time to time uh, fear. Uh, not to feel uh, fear, it's not a heroism. Um, but the uh, important is not to let the fear to manipulate our life. Mm. Uh, we must live in the situation which was given from God to us. Yes. So, um, I understand later on, after this experience in 1992, uh, the late Pope John Paul II then appointed you to the Council for um, Non-Believers. Can you tell us a bit about that your work on this council? I met uh, John Paul II first, uh, just before the Velvet Revolution. It was uh, uh, the first possibility for us to travel to the West, the canonization of Agnes of Prague. And I met uh, Pope John uh, Paul II uh, just a day before the fall of the Berlin Wall. And we've got a wonderful uh, discussion. And then, after the fall of communism, he invited me to prepare his first visit to Czechoslovakia. And after this, he appointed me to this council. The council uh, for non-believers was one of the fruits of uh, Vatican II. Uh, the initiator and the first president of this council was the great uh, Cardinal Koenig uh, mm -hmm. from uh, Archbishop of Vienna. Uh, so uh, it was the body for studying uh, the problems of atheism, the situation of atheism, and how uh, and to try to find an answer to this challenge. Uh, this council was closed in uh, 1993, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, maybe somebody in the Vatican thought that after the fall of communism there will be no more <laughs> <laughs> non-believers. Uh, I, I think it was a fault, mm. uh, it was a mistake, uh, but uh, there is now uh, the Council for Culture, uh, 
which is also very important. And uh, the atheism is part of our culture. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned earlier that um, you know, in your time during that communist period, you did you worked with the seekers, the agnostics, the atheists. It was all part of the your working experience. Um, you said something to that effect when in 2014 you received the prestigious Templeton Prize and I'd like to quote one of the things that you said and get your thoughts on it. You said, I am deeply convinced that the chief task of faith and theology is to teach us the art of living amid life's paradoxes and the courage to enter the cloud of unknowing. Is this still possible as most Western society, civilization, it's quite secular these days. What is um, what can faith and theology still teach us in our world today? Uh, so I, I think uh, that the seekers should uh, seek <laughs> and uh, go deeper and deeper, and uh, especially in this time, we need the courage to enter the cloud of mystery and to live with uh, paradoxes, because uh, the populist offering us uh, the simple answers to complex questions. And it is a great temptation uh, to, uh, to try to give the very simple answers, uh, but uh, there are no good simple answers. Uh, we should uh, uh, take the problems of our time in our hearts and minds. Uh, so, I think uh, there are many seekers in, in, uh, uh, in our time. It's no more the secular society, it's a post-secular society. So the secular humanism is not the only option mm -hmm. or the dominant option. There is a great pluralism, pluralism of spiritualities, and uh, uh, the Christianity became the choice Christianity and not just the traditional Christianity, not just mm -hmm. the heritage of our fathers and, uh, and um, uh, from the past. Uh, I think it's uh, very important and it is really uh, um, a kairos, it is the opportunity for the, for, for, for the church. Uh, yes, we live in time of uh, of crisis, of the traditional religiosity, but a crisis is always a chance. And mm -hmm. I think uh, we need the chirology, so the theology as a hermeneutics, as a uh, understanding, as an interpreting of the science of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, we should interpret what God is saying to us in our contemporary culture, to study the contemporary culture. So uh, f the evangelization must be inculturation, mm -hmm. and we need to study and to understand the today's culture, the real question of the contemporary people. Sometimes the preacher is saying, and now we'll put ourselves the question, and he asks the question which nobody asks. <laughs> uh, the question, he knows already the answer. Yeah. But I think there are some questions that are better than answers. There are some good questions which shouldn't be spoiled yeah. by answers. And God, time to time, is coming to us as a question, as a challenge for a meditation. And uh, uh, I think this courage to enter the cloud of mystery, mm. to enter uh, the paradoxes of life, it is our task, especially today. Yeah, absolutely. And in your book, uh, your award-winning book, Patience with God, that's something that you talk about, um, you know, that God requires us to persevere with our doubts and to, to carry them in our hearts, to be comfortable with them. I wonder, um, do you think that that's a challenge uh, that atheists or fundamentalists, do you think that that's too much of a challenge for them to, to be able to sit with that doubt? Uh, I do. I think uh, that uh, time to time we are all confronted mm -hmm. with the silence of God, yeah. with the hiddenness of God. They are the dark nights yeah. of the soul, uh, not only in our individual lives, but also in the history of church, there are some collective nights of mm -hmm. the soul. But uh, the mystics, 
uh, teach us that it is an opportunity. It is a time for maturity. Uh, in confrontation with the silence of God, there is a temptation of a very superficial reaction. Mm -hmm. One superficial reaction is the atheistic reaction. So, God doesn't speak to me, uh, God does not exist, God is dead. Uh, I think it is uh, a repeat shortcoming. Mm -hmm. And uh, the fundamentalists are uh, repeating uh, again and again the old formula. Uh, the enthusiast, uh, the uh, emotional uh, religion is repeating the hallelujah, hallelujah, and they are uh, not able to uh, listen this mm. uh, music of silence of God. And I think the mature, uh, the mature religiosity needs patience mm. and faith, love, and hope. Yeah. They are three sorts of patience with the silence of God. Mm. Faith, love and hope I think is something that is um, really lived by our current Pope, Pope Francis. Um, can you tell us a bit about, um, have you met him before and um, what, are we, what can we learn from him as the leader of our church today? I think with the Pope Francis, a uh, new era in Christianity is, is uh, beginning. I met him just once, uh, very shortly, uh, but I read practically every day his uh, very uh, simple uh, preachers from uh, St. Mark, uh, but it is the reflection of the Holy Gospel. It is returning to the Gospel. I think uh, in the previous period, uh, something substantial of the Gospel was a little bit overshadowed by the problems like the sexual morality and so Yes, of course, they are important problems, that, but they are not the most important problems. Mm -hmm. And now I think uh, it is the turn back to the core of the Holy Gospel, uh, to uh, the uh, solidarity with people, especially with the uh, poor, uh, our responsibility for the creation, our uh, responsibility for the peace in the world, uh, our courage uh, for our dialogue with others, mm -hmm. with other cultures, with other religions. Uh, it is the Christianity of open mind and open heart. And I think we need this Christianity now. Mm. I'll end with uh, one last question. I know you're working on a, another book to come up this later this year. Can you tell us a bit about this new book? Yes, uh, it will be the book about uh, love. Uh, my two books, they were already translated into English, Patience is God and A Night of the Confessor, were books about uh, faith and hope. But now the time is coming to think something new uh, of the theology and spirituality of love, love of God and love of neighbor, uh, even our uh, enemies. Mm. Um, uh, the title of my book is I Want You to Be. Uh, it's a quotation from St. Augustine. Volo uh, amo, volo ut sis. I love you, it means I want you to be. Mm. And uh, I think that sometimes there are some people, they have the certainty of faith, they have no doubts. But uh, in their subconsciousness, they would prefer if God does not exist. Mm. Because in their subconsciousness is a very false image of God. Uh, and they are other people. They have not this certainty. They don't know if God exists and what does it mean uh, that God exists. Uh, but they yearn for it, mm. they have the desire, they want God to be. And I think this desire is very important for us. Uh, our uh, God depends not on our wishes, but our salvation depends of uh, uh, the 
kind of a relation to God. And I think it's not enough to believe in God. I got one uh, provocative sentence in this, uh, in this book uh, that uh, I think that God uh, does not care so much about uh, whether we believe in him or not, but uh, uh, what uh, he uh, really wants that uh, we love him. Uh, he, um, it, uh, he, he is interested in the quality of our love because faith in the, uh, in the sense uh, how the people uh, usually use this word, uh, just the uh, religious conviction, mm -hmm. some theory about God, it is nothing which could, uh, which could save us. For our salvation is important to the face with love. Uh, so, and, 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 and how should we love God? Uh, we couldn't love God uh, as we love uh, our partners, our friends, our parish, our, our, our work, because uh, God is not an object. He is also not the object of love. He is love itself. Mm -hmm. God is like light. We cannot see light. We see the world, the things in light. So we can see and we can love the world in God. To love somebody and something in God, it means to love him or it uh, deeply not uh, that we should own somebody, uh, the opposite, we should open our heart and our mind to accept uh, the others as they are, and uh, uh, love is not just an uh, emotion, love is the transcendence, mm -hmm. uh, to love somebody it means uh, I he is for me more worthy than I am for myself. I prefer him uh, and I uh, can overcome my egoism. Uh, so it is a true love. And if we love in this way, uh, God is uh, the uh, deep dimension of this relation. There is something sacred, something unconditional in this kind of love, and this is God. So uh, when people say uh, you must first believe in God and then you can love him, I say no. Uh, God is love. We must love, and in the experience of love we can discover the mm -hmm. sense of the word God. Wonderful. Well, I can't wait to read that book, I Want You To Be. Monsignor Halleck, it's been a privilege. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.